precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him. Trust in the good times and the bad times, the tough times and the easy times, the ups and the downs of life. When nothing is consistent, learn that His love, His grace, His strength, His courage is consistent in our lives. Jesus, Jesus. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that as you bear much fruit and become my disciples, we'll stop um, there. This morning, I just want us to reflect on, on the abiding love of God. I want us to just reflect on this idea of abiding in God and having His Spirit abide in our lives. Welcome to everybody that is with us today, to all of those that are here with us at St. Mark's New Church Hall and to everybody that is joining us online, welcome. It's good to um, e-see you today or virtually see you today, however we describe that. Apologies for the bit of the mix-up at the beginning. For some reason the camera decided to do something different and I was on my side and that was not going to be good. Um, so but we are all good now, I think. So yeah, we want to reflect on just the abiding love of God, this idea that God's love abides in us, and this idea that we are called to abide in Him. And isn't it interesting, in the book of John, chapter number 15, when, when, when Jesus wants to talk about a fruitful life, He brings up this idea of a garden. And a garden is an interesting thing. It, it's, you know, whenever you go out there to tend to your garden, the aim is that your garden will be more fruitful. The aim is that your garden will grow more. It will be more luscious, more beautiful. That's the aim of it. And isn't it interesting, when we think about God, when we think about God's love, His aim is that we will be more. More loving, more hopeful, more peace. More joy, more beautiful. 
more. God wants more for us. And it's interesting, he, he, in the text, he gives us, he says, abide in me as I in you. Um, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And those who abide in me will bear much fruit. And you can read this text because he says, those that don't abide in me, he says, they, they wither and die. And, and he says, you know, whatever does not abide in me is thrown away and withers. And you can almost see this text as sort of threatening in some sense. But it's not. It's not meant to be. It's factual. That if we are not abiding in God, and, and this, uh, this idea of abiding is sort of having God as our source. When you think of a vine, a vine is connected to something. And through that vine, all of the, the life flows through that vine. And it grows in the leaves and the flowers that grow out of that vine. And so the idea this morning is that this text is just factual. Yeah. That if we are not being fruitful, what it's saying, it's good for nothing. It kind of reminds me of Corinthians a little bit, where it says, if I had not love, it doesn't matter, it's nothing. And it said, if, it, if it's nothing, then the only purpose of something that is nothing is it's just gathered up and thrown away. Yeah. Because it has no worth. And what we get this morning is this idea that there is worth for us when we abide in God. When we allow God's Spirit to abide in our lives. And, and it's interesting because if I'd have gone on to re read... Um, verse 9, it really drops us, it, it really tells us right, rather what all of the, the abiding is about. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I have loved you, abide in my love. And that's what it's about at the end of the day. It's about abiding in his love and allowing his spirit to abide in us, his love to abide in our lives, that we bring forth the fruit that comes from those things. And so this morning, I just want us to pray. I want us to pray, Holy Spirit, fill us again. I want us to pray, Holy Spirit, live in us again. I want us to pray, fill us until some of the negative stuff starts to seep away. I want us to pray, fill us until the stuff that we're struggling with becomes a bit more easy. I want us to pray, fill us until where we think feel that we're losing or we have been losing, we start to win. Fill us again this morning. So wherever you are this morning, whether you're here at it, St. Mark's, whether you're at home, in your living rooms, in your homes, I want you just to lift your hands with me right now. I want you to invite the Holy Spirit into your life again. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to saturate every part of your life, even those dark parts, the shadow parts that you hide from everybody else. Fill me, Lord. Let light fill every part of my being, every part of my spirit, every part of my soul, every part of who I am. Let light shine in the darkest places of my life, Lord God, until love sprouts up and joy sprouts up and hope sprouts up and goodness sprouts up and faith sprouts up and mercy. Fill us again this morning. Almighty God, we praise you. Loving Father, nurturing Mother, we come before you this morning and we just pray, do your gardening works in our lives. Do your gardening in the garden of our lives, Lord. Prune off the things that are not right. Cut off the things that are dead. Put away the leaves that are no longer giving life and the bits of us that are no longer sustaining or giving health to anybody. Put away those bits, Lord, and let new life grow. So as we are in the uh, time of year when it is spring and we've had the time of year where everything has, has withered away and it's died, but now we are seeing the shoots of spring spring up. I am praying for spring growth in our lives. I'm praying for spring growth in our finances. I'm praying for spring growth in our families. I'm praying for spring growth in us, in our attitudes, in our spirits, in a, in, on the inside of us. Let there be shoots of spring growing up, Lord God. We just pray for that today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill us with your love, your goodness, your hope. I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters right now. I don't know what... Um, 
every one of them is facing or struggling with. But you know, Lord, you know the things that are worrying them. And so we lift sick family members before you right now. And we pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for courage. We lift difficult situations and circumstances before you right now. And we pray, Lord God, for intervention. We lift, Lord God, uh, uh, relationships before you right now. And all of the things that relationship brings. And we just pray, Lord God, help us to bring life into those relationships. And as we talk about healing today and wholeness today, we lift each and every one of us before you and we pray for healing and wholeness in our lives. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we lift our world before you. We lift our world that is war-torn, Lord. War all over the place, but this war in Ukraine. Um, we lift it before you today and we just pray that you will touch the hearts of leaders, Lord God. We pray that every time there is conflict in our world, it's the innocent people that are harmed. Children, mothers, fathers, doctors, teachers, shop workers, people that have very little choice about the things they can do, Lord. The, the people fleeing. I pray, Lord, that it's, as refugees... Um, flee Ukraine, Lord, that you will open up the hearts of this nation and all of the other nations, Lord, and help us to open our, our, the doors of where we are to be welcoming and invite people in. And we know that's not perfect. We know that people come with all different kinds of stuff. But Lord, help us to be love, hope, joy and strength. And so we pray for all of these appeals that are happening right now. We pray that the money and the resources get to the right people and the right places, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that the leaders of our world will work to bring an end to this conflict, Lord, so that everyday people like us can live their lives in peace and harmony how they want to. And so we thank you and we praise you this morning and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. I just want you to stand on your feet with me right now. And I just want you to lift your voices. Lift your hearts. Uh, just open your mouths in praise to God. Let's clap our hands. Let's stand our feet. Let's lift our voices. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into our lives. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into this place.
Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Not in an abstract sense, but Lord, in a real sense, we have experienced your goodness. Our testimony is in spite of everything that has happened, in spite of all that has come and gone, in spite of everything that could have and has already gone wrong, Lord, you have been good. The crisis did not overwhelm us. The sickness did not destroy us. The plotting, the planning, the scheming of our enemies did not overwhelm us. But Lord, we've come out of every trial still breathing, still living, still breathing. And we thank you, God, that in everything we have hope in Christ. And so we bless you today. And we ask that you would speak to us, that you would minister to our hearts and our spirits, um, touch my mind, my mouth, my intentions, my affections, that I will be able to clearly share what I believe you have given me to share with this community. And I thank you, love, honor, and adore you, and I praise you. So thank the Lord, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated, everyone, um, everywhere. Okay. Great. So we're continuing the message, and I want to say good morning, still morning to everybody, both who are live with us in St. Mark's Centre in Mitchell, and everybody online. I can't see you all, but I'm, I'm just trusting and believing that you're there. <laughs> Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and it's so good to see every single one of you. Um, some of you may be looking at the graphics. So what you've got is um, two adults, an adult male and an adult female, standing back to back. And what you have within those adults are two children um, facing each other. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, the text that I'm going to be sharing from is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. But we're just continuing on our series of messages on healing, focusing on healing the past in the present to propel us to a whole and healthy future, one a future that has been prepared for us by God. And last week, Maureen spoke about going back to go forward, and I want to continue that. So let's get to the text, shall we? Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. When I was a child, I spoke, underline spoke, like a child. I thought, underline thought, like a child. And I reasoned, underline reasoned, like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end, the King James Version I think is more fair, it says I put away, I don't think you ever put an end to, yeah. I think the King James Version says I put away childish ways, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I, 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 I reasoned like a child, but when I became an adult, I put away childish ways. Um, Lord help us. I want to just do part two, go backwards, go forwards. Um, this verse is almost a giveaway verse. It's almost um, a giveaway statement that Paul is using as he comes to the end and the climax of his talk on love. And so it's easy to be ignored. There's only one other speaker, um, and this was Bishop T.D. Jakes in a message Forever the victim, I don't think so. Coming back 20, 20 odd years ago. There's only one person I've heard ever deal with this one passage of scripture. It can be so easily ignored. But I think it is absolutely loaded and pregnant with therapeutic potential. If we can hold on to what the text is trying to get us to think about. Just by way of context, Paul is writing his first letter, which actually is a response to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, Corinth, is like Amsterdam uh, or Las Vegas. 
It's a party city. Yeah? Um, red light district. It's like when people used to do the sex tourism in Thailand, parts of Thailand. You know, it's, it's, it's that type of city. People used to say you're acting the Corinthian when people were acting in a lewd way. It's that, that's kind of how Corinth was. And so it's filled with people who have gone through trauma, been trafficked, been abused. Um, people have even been abusers within all kinds of exploitation, all kinds of psychic trauma within the congregation. And so they are immature in a wide range of ways and it manifests itself within the church in Corinth with, with um, the resurgence of competitive rivalries, um, addictive patterns and um, dysfunctional ways of behaving and relating. And, and what we find is that they are extremely gifted. The gifts of the Spirit are in strong evidence in Corinth. And, uh, and sometimes we think that your giftedness is a sign of your maturity. But Paul begins, um, he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. In the, at the end of chapter 12, he says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, and have wisdom and all prophecies, and if I don't have love, I'm nothing. So Paul is showing a more excellent, a more mature way of being. And so, so what we see in Corinth is if you have power, but you have not maturity, you're like kids playing with their parents' power tools. Somebody is going to get hurt. So Paul makes the argument that love is the more excellent way. And in chapter 13, Paul poeti poetically outlines the nature and the priority of love and calls the Corinthians to maturity. And uh, in verse 11, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. There's a counsellor, um, and he passed away just at the end of the 20th century by the name of Harvey Jackins. And Harvey Jackins says this, um, the person in the grip of old distress says things that are not permanent, does things that don't work, fails to cope with the situation and endures terrible feelings that have nothing to do with the present. It's interesting, isn't it? We said again, the person in the grip of an old distress says things that are not pertinent, does things that do not work, fails to cope with the situation and endures terrible feelings that have nothing to do with the present. How many times have you found yourself being the person in the grip of an old distress? Saying things that are unhelpful. Doing things that are not working. And generally failing to cope with situations and feelings that have nothing to do with the present context. Experts in child development and parenting tell us that there are a wide range of things that all children need to grow into healthy and functional persons. There's a parenting website and it, it talks about developing and raising happy, confident, cooperative children and it says what happy, confident, Co cooperative children generally need are the following. I'm, I've got one and a half pages of a list of what these kids need. I'm just going to highlight a few of them, just a few of them. So, um, so happy, confident, cooperative children generally need to feel safe and secure, to feel loved and liked, to feel warmly connected to others, to feel listened to, understood and acknowledged. They, they believe my thoughts and my feelings are important in my family. They feel respected and, 
and value. Some of our parents didn't get the memo. Um, <laughs> they, need, they need to feel encouraged. Lots of positive reflection can express their needs for help, attention, and support without fear. Are allowed and supported to express their strong feelings. If they don't get it out, they will act it out. It goes on to say, they are free to largely learn at their own pace, have lots of fun, play and laughter with family and friends, are protected from overexposure to TV, computer screens, um, and particularly protected from adult themes, are protected from sexual abuse, um, they live in em an emotionally responsible, healthy, mature family. They get enough sleep, rest, and downtime, including reading, art, free play. They have adults who spend time with them. They get regular quality one-on-one -on -one time with their parents or parents. They feel confident that conflicts can be worked through and learned from together. My siblings in Christ, that is a very, very tall order. And, and, I, and I know, I know from the way some of you are looking at me, who in the world wrote that? I just want to know, did they have kids? <laughs> uh, um, see, if we're honest, we have to admit that there's some things on that list that we did not get. We did not get, and those of us who are parents, there's some things on that list that we didn't give or we don't give. Um, it, and it's interesting because it's our unmet childhood and childish, when I say childish, I mean childlike needs that assert themselves when we are afraid, when we are hurt, or when we are angry. Have you ever had a situation when you behave in a way that is totally disproportionate to the situation in hand? Yeah. You know, by any imagination, when you're calm and you come back to yourself, you have to admit, I overreacted. <laughs> you know, I just grossed this out. And was looking at me because we had one of those moments this week. And, and if you're honest, if you go back, it's because it touched on something that reminded you of something when you didn't have power and you couldn't say no and you didn't have choice and it's very likely you were a child. Holistic therapist Nicole LaPera um, writes, um, what, what she writes is, um, she writes, we all have a childlike part of ourselves. This childlike part is free and filled with wonder and connected to the inner wisdom of our authentic self. So when we say childish, it's normally seen to be a negative thing. But it doesn't have to be a negative thing. Because there's something like childish faith, childish joy, childish freedom. Those things are positive things. And it says this same inner child, like part of each of us, um, when unacknowledged can run rampant in adult life, often reacting impulsively and selfishly. This is the definition of what I want to talk about today. Inner child wounds are the consistently unmet physical, emotional and spiritual needs from our childhood expressed through our subconscious that continue to impact on our present self. Let me say that again. Inner child wounds are consistently unmet emotional, spiritual, uh, physical and spiritual needs from our childhood expressed through our subconscious that continue to impact our present self. It's when our unmet needs subconsciously continue to impact on our present needs and functioning that we're in trouble. Um, you don't want my wounded child to show up in the office. You don't want my wounded child to show up in the shop. You know? Um, can I have that TV? No. Pardon? You can't have that TV. What do you mean I can't have that TV? I've got the money. I can afford it. Why can't I have that TV? It's not for you. I don't think you, can, I don't think you should have that TV. I can't have that TV. Bro! <laughs> 
Are you are you joking, Sam? <laughs> All of the kind of gentleman goes out the window, and what comes out is that petulant child. Hear what, yeah? Get your manager. <laughs> what, you are the manager? Let me come out of this dusty shop. <laughs> Inner child. We've had it, we've all had it. We've all, we've had it. And, and, and later on, we look back, we're in barracks. Because we know we acted the fool. Our inner child. In relationships, in our interactions with others, we have to be careful. Um, uh, La Pera says this, um, and I think it's important. The inner child is a petrified, and petrified needs to be frozen with fear. A petrified part of our psyche that formed when we were limited in our emotional coping abilities. In other words, we couldn't help ourselves at the time. This is why many of us act like children when we are threatened or upset. The reality is that many of us are stuck in this childlike state. We are emotionally illiterate because we are little children in adult bodies. And let's not point the finger because I know, I know some of us, we can find five people who just, that's them. They explain this. That, that there explains <laughs> but actually, come on, let's, let's stop looking out the window and start looking in the mirror. Um, the, you know, the, and I don't want to take a lot of time here, but um, there's a, the ex, this excellent book by La Pereira. It's called, um, sorry, I don't have my foot now. It's called How to Do the Work. Um, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a useful book. And what the period um, does is identify seven archetypes. I'm not even going to try to explain it because I want to use the time that I've got wisely. So the caretaker who believes that the only way to, to love is to care for others. The overachiever who believes I need to be seen. So they're always achieving, achieving, achieving. So they, I'm here. I'm doing good. Look at me. And then you have the underachiever who wants to fly under the radar. Bring no attention to themselves. Won't try because they're terrified to fail. Um, the rescuer protector who believes they have to rescue everybody. They have to be everybody's saviour. They have to solve everybody's problem. The life of the party. They have to make everybody else feel happy. So they're the ones always making jokes to cut the tension. So they play the clown because they find out that when everybody's angry, it becomes an unsafe environment. So they manage the environment by making jokes and making light of the situation. The yes person. Who says yes to everybody but themselves. Yeah. And the hero worshipper. This is the cheerleader of the, of the person. Oh, you're so wonderful. And when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And you have adults all like that. Yeah. I have, you know, in my life I've met people who come up to you and say, Oh my God, you're so wonderful. You're so great. And I really feel like I want to wash when I finish talking to them. <laughs> it's, it's icky. But actually, it's because... The inner child needs somebody to look up to. Okay, so within the text, Paul identifies three ways in which our wounded and neglected inner child attempts to assert itself and disrupt our relationship and our behaviors. Um, and I want to share with you. So number one, in the way we speak. Paul says, I spoke like a child. Number two, in the way we think. And it's a particular type of thinking. In other words, how we evaluate situations. Is, is this good or is this bad? Is this person right or is, there, uh, is it wrong? Is this the best way to go about doing this particular thing? Okay? And then I reasoned like a child. And this reasoning has to do with the way I see the world, the way I perceive the world, my perception. Paul challenges us to put away childish things. Put away childish speaking. Put away childish thinking. Put away childish reasoning. Sorry, let me get the third one up there. Sorry, there. I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned 
like a child. So I spoke like a child. What is this? When, when I speak like a child, this is when somebody just babbles. They, they, they say a lot, but they really say nothing. It's when they, when they excessively speak. And we all do this from time to time. Have you ever been in a situation where you're nervous and you're trying to impress people? Yeah. And you just, your mouth, and you're thinking that, and you're saying to yourself, shut up, stop talking. Stop talking now. But your mouth keeps going. Especially those of us who go into formal meetings when we feel like we're imposters. I have to, I have to sound like I belong in this meeting. Yes, yes, yes. And of course, point two is the agenda. Very, very important point. Well, point two is matters arising from the last meeting. Oh, oh, I, I didn't mean that one. I meant, you know, why are you babbling? But, but let's go deeper. Because what if this is, this is when we are speaking impulsively without giving appropriate attention to the import and the impact of our words. It's when, when in relationship we use the B word. I'm going to get a divorce. In the relationship, we, get, we, we throw that word, I'm leaving you. Or the other, the other, the other B word, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm not getting what I want, so I'm done. And the moment we say it, we regret it. It's when a child says to their parent, I hate you. And the parent, this is the worst one, when the parent says, I hate you back. <laughs> or, or, we never planned for you to be here. <laughs> you get crashed. <laughs> no, that was harsh. <laughs> but these are the things, impulsive words that we throw out. And we, when, we, when we know that we're going to hit below the bed, bell. My dad, um, because he grew up in the post-war era, he used analogies from war. And when they had sea, war, sea, sea, sea fights, um, and there was a submarine under in the depths, um, what they would do is throw down what they call a depth charge. And a depth charge was a bomb, that when you drop this bomb, everything deep would come up. And you know in an argument, you've got your depth charge. That's word. That, that word, if you ever bring out that scenario, that word, and you throw it out, everything deep is coming up. How we are with our words. How are you speaking? Think about yourself now. How are you speaking in childish ways? How does your wounded and unheard child show up in your speech? When was the last time you bit somebody's head off? Not because of what they did per se, but because you were in the grip of an old distress. And your wounded and neglected child spoke out in your defense. Then Paul says, I thought like a child. The word translated as thought in the New, Re New Revised Standard Version in this word comes from a Greek word which means to reckon, to calculate to count, to take into account, to evaluate, to estimate, hence to think about. And this refers to the way we evaluate or judge reality. And, and, and so when we think about our wounded, our neglected child, it's the way we currently value things based on the wounds or, ne or the neglect of our basic needs in childhood. So, so when I was a child, I had very wavy and curly hair. Uh, which endeared me to some of the old ladies at church because I had good hair. Yeah. Yes. See, good hair. All right. So, so there, was, there was one lady in church, her name was Sister Buchanan, who we used to call Sister Buck. This is, I was a young child at the time. And each Sunday, Sister Buck would give me 50 pence uh, for the collection. Now, 50 pence in those days was like five pounds today. You could buy a happy meal at McDonald's for 50 pence. No, we didn't have McDonald's back in those days, not in London. Okay. <clears throat> so I grew up in a family of eight with my dad being the only breadwinner. And money was not just tight, it was absolutely scarce. So me having a whole 50 pence to myself, my, it is mine. <laughs> whole was a, it's an absolute luxury 
and there was no way under God's blue sky and on God's green earth I was ever going to put that 50 pence in the offering plate. It was just, it just, it was not going to happen. So I would just sneak out and go to the corner shop and buy myself as many sweets as my 50 pence and come back in church. Here's the problem. Um, one of the messages in my household was that thou shalt not rob God. Yeah. Um, and, 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 um, and, and if you didn't pay tithes or give in the collection, they would quote that scripture in Malachi which said, you are cursed with a curse. And, um, and my mother said that people who did not pay their tithes, that's what my mother would say. Um, and I'm not blaming her, I'm just saying, okay? I mean, my mother would say that people who don't pay their tithes or give in the offering would be like a bucket with a hole in the bottom. Every time they fill up the bucket, by the time they get home, it all drains out because they are not giving to God and they are cursed. With a curse, they would never have what they were able to, what they needed uh, when they did not give money in the collection. So guess what? I was robbing God every week. And my little self, my childish self, internalized the guilt and the shame about money. And I was petrified about God who was angry with me because I had stolen God's money and bought Ruffles, which was a dark chocolate, strawberry flavored coconut soup. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and I lived in the grip of an old distress. Now here's the real world real consequence of this. As a result of this, I thought, I thought, and I had internalized the message that I was cursed, and I could not have financial success. And the way it showed up is as soon as I got money, I would spend it. We ended up £60,000, £67,000 in debt because an adult man was making childish decisions based on a message he heard in childhood that I was cursed. It was only when I did a program, a, a, a course in neuro-linguistic programming that I started to look at the, the map, my mental image. And my mental image was this bucket with a hole in the bottom. And every time I would fill it up, I had no problem making money. I always made money. But every time I would fill it up, it would drain out the bottom. And I had to, in that moment, it happened in a moment. It happened in a moment. I wanted the change happened in a moment. And in a moment, I replaced that image. Instead of seeing myself with a bucket, I saw myself and my money as a plant in a garden that needed to be nurtured and cared for. And if it was nurtured and cared for, it was cared for, it would grow. I rejected the idea that I was cursed. And I believed that I was blessed and I embraced that truth. And as a result of that, we paid off all our debt and then began to thrive financially. It's a, it sounds like a silly story, but do you see how these words that are spoken can get lodged in your heart and change the way you think? And the question I want to ask you is how is your past, wounded and neglected child, disrupting your evaluation of your present realities? What are the kind of things that are being said to you and in your own mind and are coming at you from all different directions? How are the unhelpful and untrue messages about spirituality, family, sexuality, money, intelligence, Destiny and development no longer serving you. You know, no, oh, she's the bright one. Come on. He's the hard working one. She's the lazy one. As if that's your destiny. And nothing can change. The troublemaker, the noisy one. The, the, yeah, all of these things. In what ways do you need to repent? Literally, from the Greek, meta, change, noia, mind. In what ways do you need to change your mind? Change your life, change your thinking, and be renewed in the words of St. Paul, in, or the, sorry, the writer of, of the Ephesians, in the spirit of your mind. Then Paul says, not only did I speak as a child, I, I, I thought as a child, he said, I reasoned. 
They want to say reason. A reason like a child. In other words, my reasoning. The word reasoning from the Greek encompasses the frame of mind, the mental attitude, the mindset, your paradigms. Your paradigms. Sorry. So your paradigms. Paradigms, have, it has to do with thinking processes of the mind. And it expressly has to do with the attitude of your mind, the frame of your mind. In his seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, uh, Stephen Covey talks about paradigms. And what Covey says is that a simple way to understand a paradigm is to see it as a map. We all know that the map is not the territory. It's simply an explanation of certain aspects of the territory. That's exactly what a paradigm is. A paradigm is a theory, an explanation, a model for how you see the world. Um, the, the reasonings. Covey continues, he says, paradigms are powerful because they create the lens through which we see the world. So if you believe everybody you meet is racist, you're armed and ready to fight. You're ready. There's no way you're going to disrespect me. So you're ready on 10. You're coming in on 10. You racist mofo. <laughs> Racist, I'm ready for you. Because in your mind, you're armed and you're ready for battle. Everybody's sexist, everybody is this. Everybody. If you come with that mentality, you're ready for a fight. Every, they're out to get you. And you're living with that all the time. All the time. Now, this is the thing the power of a paradigm shift. Someone say paradigm shift. If you can shift your paradigm. Now, not everyone is not out to get me. There are some people I know are out to get me. Let's just be real. There are some folk that are out to get me. And I have to watch those folk. But there are other folks who can help me. And I need to test the spirit. <laughs> okay? And the shift can be instant. Childhood, childish reasoning is reasoning that is conditioned by a wounded and neglectful child. Neglected child who thinks and acts irrationally and impulsively. So let me give you some examples. Some, some intrusive and unhelpful thoughts include ideas such as, I'm not good enough. So how many jobs have you talked yourself out of? How many opportunities that you've walked away from because in your mind there is this paradigm that says, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm not as lucky as other people are. I don't think I'll ever be this or I don't think I'll ever do that. I should be better than I am. And sometimes we judge ourselves, don't we? I'm 45 now, I'm 52 now, I should be here, I should have this, I should have that. And most of the time, the should words, you need to be careful of. The should words and the must words, you need to be careful of. You need to start replacing that, is what do you want to do? Not should you, do you want to? Nobody cares, I'm not smart enough. I didn't do well at school. I'm going to be a failure. I don't have a degree. I don't have this. Or, or my, my qualification is not relevant today. Bad things always happen to me. How has your wounded and neglectful child <coughs> warped and hijacked your reasoning, your paradigms, and your conceptual map? What I love about the text is Paul says, when I became an adult. Everyone say, when I became an adult. There has to be a time in your life when you grow up. Not in a negative way, but, but you come to a place of maturity and responsibility and you say, I don't want any more of this. I want to change the way I speak. I want to change the way I think. I want to change the way I reason. Um, he says, when I became an adult, I put away childish things. The word translated adult means a mature person who is able to take responsibility. That's what it means. Someone, I'm not going to blame anybody for what's going on in my life. Yeah, there are maybe people who did things, but what's happening today is my responsibility. If I let you try to do that today, that's on me. And then the phrase, I put away childish things, which means to render idle. It means to render impotent. I mean, to render, uh, to, to, to unemploy, in other words, I'm not using it anymore. To inactivate or make in, uh, inoperative. And the question I want to ask you is, how do you deactivate these childish things? How do I deactivate my inner child that's throwing a temper tantrum, throwing all these crazy thoughts and getting me into all kinds of trouble? 
How do I do it? Paul, thank God, gives us um, a way that we can do it. Number one, he says we need to put away childish things. And I want to share with you three ways to put away childish things. And then I'm going to take my seat. Number one, you've got to face them. You've got to face them. You've got, we spend a lot of time running from where we came from. Running from what we've been through, running from what we, and we deny it. We act like our childhood was peachy. That it was just because it was normal. It was not. Everybody we know went through life like this. This is why certain communities where physical chastisement is normalized. I know of a, I know of a guy who um, was sent from the UK to England and he misbehaved. And you know what they did? They, they, they dug a hole for him in a termite nest and made him stand in that termite nest for hours with all these angry termites biting his feet. Another, another practice that was very common in the Caribbean and I understand in the United States and some places here where, where the parents would let the child go out and get a stick from the tree. And they would stand there and peel the switch. And then have them on the pole and whip them. And, and you will have people who say, that's why we've got so much um, trouble in our community now. We've taken away the parents' right to physically abuse children. We don't want to, we won't let me beat my child, no discipline. And, and the problem was, the parents who were disciplined, it was their child doing the discipline. It was their inner child. Because that's why they were, you know, I remember beating this. My mum was preaching when she was beating me. Yeah. You're too <laughs> wicked. <laughs> and <laughs> bad. <laughs> why? <laughs> you won't <laughs> be here your <laughs> self. <laughs> Got blood coming out. Mommy, I'm bleeding. Look here. Pop, pop, pop. I'm laughing, but I'm crying because it happens. And we all have stories. Those of us from the, um, the Caribbean, those of us from West Africa, those of us even Nigeria, Ghana, and other places, we have a similar experience. And, and just because it was done to us, it doesn't make it right. Likewise, our working class English folks have a similar experience because oftentimes it's a traumatized child in an adult body doing discipline. Face it. James Borden said, not everything that, that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. The goal of this message is for your adult self to lovingly and compassionately face your wounded and neglected child and for you to give that child the kindness and the love that they deserve. Stop ignoring your child. Stop judging your child. Stop blaming your child. Stop chastising your childish self. Go back to go forward. Tell yourself that you are loved, that you are worthy, that you are deserving. And from now on, find ways to identify what your inner child needs and lovingly address those needs. Face them. The second thing you need to do is forgive them. Forgive them. Someone say, forgive them. Forgive them. My inner child has got me in a whole lot of mess. My inner child has. And to some extent, sometimes it still is. And instead of attacking my inner child, I need to forgive. I need to forgive little Paul, who keeps getting big Paul into trouble. Um, your wounded and neglected child may have acted in a disruptive, unhealthy, and unhelpful way. But you cannot perpetuate their trauma and their negative behavior by harboring bitterness and resentment against yourself. You have to care for your inner child. And how do you care for your inner child? Acknowledge your inner child. Acknowledge what's going on. Listen to what your inner child is saying. Um, I, there's something I don't like it. Don't do it, I don't like it. I had a blow up at Ella this week. Over, um, she took some of my property. And uh, which she, 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 you know, to be fair, it wasn't a big deal. 
but it meant a lot to me because I grew up in a house where my older brothers would take my property. They would ask for it, they would take it. And then, they, no boundaries, they would take my property and then one in particular would take my shoes. These were designer shoes that I worked hard to buy and they would go to a party and kick them out. Bring it back. Put, and I had shoe trees back in those days. I put the shoe trees back on and polished the shoe. And on the only time you knew there was a big old split down the side of your shoe. I'm getting angry just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> the, only time, the only time you knew was when you put the shoes on. Or, 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 and this would happen again and again. And so I get triggered. When someone takes something without asking. And, and, and whilst I, it's not right for me to blow up at anyone today for what they do, I still don't like it when you take my stuff and don't ask. So I, I need to give my inner child the right to say you should not take it without asking. But I don't have the right to blow up at somebody. Does that make sense? Listen to your inner child. Speak to your inner child. And we do this naturally, but you do need to do it as well. Paul, stop. Paul, calm down. Step away from the human. <laughs> Behave yourself, Paul. Paul, you're talking too much. Paul, that isn't right. Paul, that's... Talk to yourself. Talk to your inner child. And then the third thing you've got to do, not only do you have to give, you have to give your inner child the love and care that you, you need and that you did not get from others. And finally, well, the third thing is express gratitude. Express gratitude. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through to 5, we boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Looking back at all that I have been through, looking back at the pain and the trauma, the wounding, the neglect, I am grateful for the journey because I am who I am because of everything I have been through. Let me say that again. I am who I am because of everything I have been through. You are who you are because of everything that you've been through. Everything you've been through, it toughened you, it stretched you, it moved you, but not only that, it created empathy within you. It creates compassion within you. You are now emotionally literate because of what you've been through. As a result of what little Paul went through, Maureen and our daughters, my friends, and my wider circle of colleagues have a more fuller, rounded, rewarding relationship with me because of all that I have been through. My pain has become a reason for my praise. And this is what Paul says when he says we boast in our sufferings. I want to tell you today, thank God for your inner child. Thank God for that little boy, that little girl, that little person that you were. But, and, and that will allow you to become a better adult. Instead of being petrified and re-traumatized by the child you were, you need to start to thank God for everything you've been through. Because the fact is, you've been through it. You survived it. You are here today in your right mind. You are not crazy. You are not strung out somewhere on antidepressants. And I'm not mocking anybody that is on antidepressants. I'm just saying that God has been good to you. Hallelujah. And what I would say is bring your wounded and neglected child to the Holy Spirit. Bring that child into the Holy Spirit's operating theater. Let her work on you. Let the Holy Spirit hover over the face of your feet. Let the Spirit bring light to your darkness and order to your chaos. Let the Spirit gather together those broken parts of your personality and bring healing and deliverance to you. Let Let the Holy Spirit move all over you. Let her encircle you in the warmth of her loving embrace. Because it's 
it's your time to be healed. It's your time to be delivered. It's your time to be blessed. It's your time to walk out of the prison of guilt and shame. It's your time to walk out of childhood trauma and into adulthood victory. It's your time to walk out of fear and, 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 and anger and strife and all kinds of traumatized behaviors and addictive and compulsive behaviors and habits. It's your time to walk in the freedom and the liberty of the children of God. Because we are not given a, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we've been given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Dear Father, oh my goodness, I feel like preaching this afternoon. We are not, we are not who we used to be. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. You need to go back, go back and hold that child. Go back and kiss that child. Go back and grab that child by the hand and say, little Paul, you're coming with me into a future that God has planned for us. God bless you. Heaven smile on you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And I'm moving on to a higher level. I'm moving on to another place of victory. I'm moving on to another place of joy. The devil will not traumatize me and re-traumatize me and then re-traumatize me with every memory spell, every clear reacquaintance of what I've been through. No, 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 I've been through it once. I'm not going to relive it again. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. But now I have a reason as a child. But now I have become an adult. I'm taking up all of my childish stuff. I'm tidying up, folks. And I'm putting them away. In other words, I'm placing them in the right category. I will remember them, I will value them, I will, be, I will forgive them, I will cherish them, but no longer will my child run around creating trauma and trouble because I've put away childish things. God bless you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we are going to go into a debrief, and I think there's, there's a lot to debrief, I think. Um, to everybody that's joined us via Facebook Live, we thank you for joining us today. Um, we're about to um, turn off, so we're going to wish you um, all God's blessings um, and a great Sunday. So God bless you. Bye.